Okay, let's continue with our lecture from yesterday. We are right in the middle of a certain topic. Namely, we are defining relativistic quantum theories in full generality. Every relativistic quantum theory must have a definition of some operator, u of lambda and a. What is the meaning of this operator? It implements Poincaré transformations on the space uh, of our quantum states. It's a linear operator and uh, it's a representation of the Poincaré group. So for every Lorentz transformation and every translation, there is a certain operator u of lambda and a. It has the representation property, so group multiplication laws are reproduced on the level of this operator. It's a linear operator, so it acts on quantum states in the appropriate way, such that linear combinations are preserved. And it is unitary, which means that scalar products or probability amplitudes are also preserved under Poincaré transformations, and that means the physics of the quantum theory is invariant under these Poincaré transformations. So this operator defines a relativistic Poincaré invariant quantum theory. And now we can go to the infinitesimal level. And uh, as always, we write infinitesimal Poincaré transformations um, with a Lorentz transformation which deviates a little bit from the unit matrix and a small translation. And for any representation, we have defined the Taylor coefficients um, of these uh, small transformations. And we can also do it here, therefore, and write u of delta plus omega comma epsilon. So this is this infinitesimal Lorentz and translation. And again, it's given by the unit operator plus i times epsilon mu times p mu minus i over 2 omega rho sigma times j rho sigma. This is the completely general decomposition. And uh, by definition, this quantity here, p mu, is the Taylor coefficient of that uh, uh, in front of epsilon. That is the Taylor coefficient in front of omega rho sigma. And uh, in this way, from our representation, which is unitary, we define here certain quantities, p and j. And they are, of course, also operators which act on the space of quantum states because u of lambda a acts on the space of quantum states. So those are also operators on our Hilbert space in the quantum theory. And uh, because of the i here, and because that is unitary, it automatically implies that these are Hermitian operators. So our representation defines Hermitian operators p mu and j rho sigma on our quantum theory. And uh, so let's write that down. They are Hermitian uh, because that is unitary and uh, by definition they now have a certain meaning, namely this is of course by definition our four momentum operator of our quantum theory and uh, this contains the operator for angular momenta. Namely, uh, j12 is equal to j in z direction and so on, but it also contains most operators. So, automatically, every Poincare invariant quantum theory uh, contains a definition of Hermitian momentum operators and angular momentum and boost operators, which also act on the space of quantum states. So that is our setup for a relativistic quantum theory. And on such theories, we can now define a notion of what we call one particle states or a definition of particles. So we can now come up with the most general definition of what we mean by a particle and write that down. So and so you can think a little bit in physics terms what uh, could be properties 
of actual uh, single particles in contrast to states which are composed of several particles or some other states which have not a characteristic of a particle. So what uh, defines a particle uh, for you in physics? And one simple definition of a particle is something that has the property if you fix its location or its momentum then its state is essentially fixed. Something like that would be a particle. Whereas any other state like two particle states is uh, fixed not by specifying one position but you need to specify something in addition the relative position between the different particles or relative velocities and so on. But for a single particle uh, the simple definition is that its state is defined once you specify where the particle is. And there are just some exceptions, namely particles might have something like a spin, an internal degree of freedom, which is a discrete additional quantum number. So up to the, uh, beyond the position, the only thing that might be different for particle states might be a discrete choice of the spin that you can assign. So that is uh, our definition of single particles, namely objects whose states are completely defined by just specifying the location and possibly uh, a discrete choice of the spin. Location in that sense is equivalent to specifying the momentum. So uh, equivalently you might say, once you specify the momentum and the spin of a particle, its state is fixed. And any object um, which has this property will now be called a particle. And so uh, for us, particles are not only elementary particles, but also there are composite objects which uh, classify as single particles. And for example, an example is the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom in its ground state behaves exactly in that way. Because uh, so the hydrogen atom in the ground state is completely fixed once you specify where the atom is, the state is uniquely defined. There is no other internal degree of freedom. All hydrogen atoms uh, are exactly identical in the ground state uh, up to maybe they are at different positions or they have different momenta. So a hydrogen atom in the ground state classifies as such a single particle. Even more complicated molecules in a ground state would classify <coughs> as such single particles in that sense. And of course uh, that also holds for the proton. The proton state is completely fixed by specifying its momentum and maybe specifying spin up or down in some direction. Yes? If you have a larger molecule, wouldn't the rotation or spatial alignment also be kind of important? Right, so there are for sure. Um, uh, <laughs> degrees of freedom or uh, different states the molecule can be in, but if the molecule has one unique ground state, then the ground state, for example, would be rotationally invariant, and then the ground state is uniquely specified by the overall momentum of the molecule or the location of the molecule. And then there are no rotations excited, that's why it's in the ground state, and then there are no such internal degrees of freedom. So uh, the uh, subtle um, additional information is that one needs to say a molecule in the ground state or a hydrogen atom in the ground state, then this classifies as a single particle in the sense that we are going to define. But a molecule overall, uh, as you say, has of course many internal degrees of freedom and it can be in many different states beyond the location and beyond the moment. Right. And for example, for the proton, you might also say, okay, uh, why is the proton state uniquely fixed by its momentum? It is uniquely fixed because uh, even though the proton is like a molecule, the proton has some inner constituents and these inner constituents, the quarks and gluons, they might also be in some excited states. But if they are in some excited states, we don't call the thing the proton anymore. The proton by definition is exactly the ground state of this ensemble of three quarks and some gluons. And the excited states of the same quark content would be called um, other baryons. 
and not protons anymore. And uh, so from that point of view, a particle is an object whose state is uniquely defined by specifying the momentum or the position and maybe uh, a discrete choice of the spin. So let us write that down. So the state is uh, uniquely characterized by the momentum and the spin. But I write spin in quotation marks because we have not yet uh, completely defined what actually spin means. And of course one should also specify the particle type. So that in particular means that there is no continuous inner degree of freedom. So a basis of states could then be written as like this. A stands for the particle type, P stands for the momentum eigenvalue and S would be this discrete spin in quotation marks which we still have to investigate what it actually means. So then, uh, because that is uh, our definition, it means that all states of a certain particle type can be uh, transformed into each other by a Lorentz transformation or by a translation. So if you translate a hydrogen atom from here to there, then you get a new state and so on. So all basis states are of, uh, let's say, type A are connected by Poincaré transformations. So they differ only by their momentum, by their direction, or by their location, by nothing else. That means if you take one state, you can reach any other state of the same particle type by applying some of these U of lambda and A. So any state can be reached from any other one by applying this U of lambda and A. And on the other hand, if you apply any U of lambda and A to a state, you obtain a state of the same particle type. So a Poincaré transformation does not change the type of the particle. It does not change the type. And uh, these three items here, they mean something mathematical. Namely, on the space of states of this particle type, we have defined uh, the action of this U of lambda and A. The action of U of lambda and A does not lead out of the space of states because the particle type is not changed. And any state can be reached by the U of lambda. So that means mathematically uh, the U of lambda and A defines uh, or is defined as a representation uh, of the Poincaré group on the space of states of this particular particle type and that representation is irreducible. So it doesn't lead out of the space and any state can be reached from any other one. There is no invariant subspace. So that means mathematically we have an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group. So the space of states of Type A forms an irreducible representation U of lambda and A of the Poincaré group. And that can also be used as an equivalent, uh, more mathematical definition of a particle type and uh, of one particle states because this mathematically summarizes all of what we have said before. 
And so if we have a representation which is irreducible, then we have had these Casimir operators. Let me first write down the Casimir operators. These were P square and W square. P square is the operator for the rest mass square, which is a Lorentz invariant quantity. And W square is this other Casimir operator, which probably means something like spin. This is also Lorentz invariant. So these uh, eigenvalues of those operators are Lorentz invariant. If we have an irreducible representation where every state can be reached from every other one, it means that those eigenvalues must be the same for all those states because they are Lorentz invariant and any state can be reached. Therefore, these uh, eigenvalues of these two operators are universal. They are specific for every particle type. Every particle type has a certain eigenvalue of p square, which is then the rest mass for that particle type, and a certain eigenvalue of w square, which would be something like the spin of that particle type. So we have fixed eigenvalues of these two operators. So rest mass and spin are fixed for uh, any type of particle. They cannot be changed. Okay, so with this we have defined our one particle states and then we can come to this final subsection of uh, this chapter here that I announced yesterday where we want to derive something really deep and interesting about the possible types of particles uh, which includes also more information on what this spin in quotation marks actually is depending on uh, some other properties of the particles. So this section is possible uh, one particle how did I call it? Representations. Let me just check something here. So, uh, if we want to write a basis for our one particle states of a certain particle type, let's call it A. Then we can think, like in quantum mechanics one, what is the set of commuting operators, and then we can simultaneously diagonalize certain operators and uh, write down a basis according to those uh, operator eigenvalues. So here, our commuting operators are First of all, P square commutes with everything, W square commutes with everything, and then P mu, all the components commute with each other. So for sure, here we have already six operators, all of which commute with each other. So we can simultaneously diagonalize all those operators. These are not interesting for us now because they have certain fixed values. We don't know which ones, but they are fixed anyway, so we do not use them as labels of our states. But these are, of course, very important labels, which are the momentum eigenvalues. So for sure, we'll use them in our basis. But then there are other operators as well, which might commute with all of them but we are not yet uh, determining which other operators there are because uh, it will depend on uh, some other details which operators we should choose here. Therefore, our states will for particle type A, let us label them in a simplified way, simply like this, P comma S. So to be compact, let us not write always the label A, because anyway in this section we are all only dealing with one particle type A, and so we label it only with the eigenvalues of the P mu operator. And uh, um, then there might be some other label, let's call it S, like spin, but we have to determine what that other label actually means. And that is what we are going to figure out.
So we know, as we said before, that this U of lambda in A um, defines an irreducible representation of uh, uh, on these states here. So all states are obtained from any other state by acting with uh, u of lambda and a. So the translations are uninteresting. Translations are obtained by exponentiating the momentum operator as usually and we already know uh, the behavior of the momentum operator. Therefore, we also know the behavior of translation, so we do not have to take into account translations. Therefore, that is not interesting to discuss. And uh, so what is interesting to discuss is the effect of Lorentz transformations lambda. For Lorentz transformations u of lambda, there are two <coughs> interesting cases to consider. What are those two interesting cases? If you imagine you act with u of lambda on exactly such a state with some given p and some given s, then two things can happen. Case A, which is the normal case, uh, this u of lambda changes the momentum of your state from p to lambda times p. You do a boost or some rotation of your momentum. So that is the, let's say, normal case. Lambda changes p to lambda times p, which is different from the original p itself. So you do some Lorentz transformations, which does something non-trivial to your momentum. And uh, then you can assume that the uh, other label, however, is left intact. Okay. Second case is the opposite. Namely, there are certain Lorentz transformations which do not change the momentum p. So p is going always to lambda p, but it can happen that lambda p is actually the same as the original p. So a certain Lorentz transformation which doesn't change the momentum. This can happen. And if that happens, then the only thing that Lorentz transformation can do is it must do something non-trivial with this other label, whatever it means. But uh, this Lorentz transformation can do all sorts of things, uh, all possibilities to this other label. Yes. Okay. And then, of course, there can be combinations. There can be combinations where you change both, but it's clear that you can at first uh, separate the two cases and study only changes in momentum or changes only in the other label. And uh, af afterwards, you would combine it. And so, in the references that I gave you yesterday, uh, in particular in Weinberg's book, you can find a very long discussion where he goes through all those different steps. But it's quite clear which is the more interesting case for us. The more interesting case is, of course, the second one, where the momentum is kept intact and we only change something with the other label, because if we investigate that, it gives us the full information on what is this additional degree of freedom of the particle beyond the momentum. That gives us all the information we might need about behavior of the spin, the nature of the spin, possible values of the spin. This is obtained just from that. And once we understand this, we can change the momentum as well, and then we have the full picture. But it's uh, essentially sufficient to study only the second case. Let me write it here, of course, all combinations. And so, in the lecture here, we will focus only on the second case. Focus only on B, because that gives us information on the internal degree of freedom.
and therefore on uh, the meaning of spin. And in order to focus on this, um, it is also not necessary to study any random value of the momentum. It is uh, possible and sufficient to select a very simple certain special momentum and study then all Lorentz transformations which keep that particular special momentum intact and uh, because we could always transform to any other momentum by uh, this kind of Lorentz transformation. So it's sufficient to consider a certain special momentum value. Once we would have done that, we can obtain the rest and the completely general case from this. And uh, we will not do all of that here, but you can find this in the literature. But we will consider here the essential point, which is uh, the degree of the inner degree of freedom for a special moment. And so actually, let me clean the blackboard immediately so that we have some space to write down some interesting tables. Because I want to do now a uh, um, case distinction in uh, our case of Poincaré invariant theories, there are two very differently behaving kinds of particles. And uh, this case distinction is not possible in a non-relativistic case, but in a relativistic case we need to distinguish between particles with rest mass zero, which move with the speed of light, and particles with rest mass non-zero, which move with speed less than the speed of light. And uh, the first kind doesn't exist, obviously, in a non-relativistic theory. So these will be our two cases, mass zero or non-zero mass. Maybe let's order it like this. And here we then might have the conclusion, but here let us write down some table. Here mass square non zero, and here mass square equal to zero. So it will not be so much, but uh, let's nevertheless uh, order it like this. And of course, the left hand side is familiar to you from non-relativistic physics because um, here we could go to the rest frame of particles and then we the speed might be very slow. So uh, whatever you know from the non-relativistic limit um, should have some simple kind of generalization here, whereas that is completely different maybe. So we want to choose now some standard momentum Let's call it k mu. k mu is a standard momentum and let's choose some standard momentum for a particle with rest mass non-zero. What could be a good choice for a standard momentum for a particle with rest mass non-zero? That could be the particle at rest. Particle at rest is certainly the simplest possibility. So the momentum for vector is simply this rest mass and then zero momentum. So that is a good choice, certainly always possible, and uh, then let us investigate these internal degrees of freedom, uh, in other words, all possible Lorentz transformations which do not change this momentum. But first, uh, let's also do the contrast here. What could be a standard uh, momentum for a um, massless particle? KMU, what kind of four vector could you choose? Any ideas? So this is not possible. No. 
So zero C zero zero. Uh, I'm moving just in the x direction with C. Uh, this is not the velocity, but the momentum. So the momentum also has an energy component. So and the energy is not zero if it has a spatial momentum and some velocity. Its energy cannot be zero. And uh, so um, that's, yeah, uh, and the momentum is not the velocity c, but it's some value of momentum. So let's let it move in the z direction. Okay. And um, the energy, however, cannot be zero, but it must be the same as the spatial momentum and then the square of this momentum k square k mu k mu is zero with this assignment. So that would be a possible choice. Okay, um, so you suggested in x direction, let me suggest in z direction, uh, then my notes are <laughs> uh, <laughs> more compatible. Uh, but anyway, that is the standard choice. So we choose, of course, one simple direction. And uh, we choose here z direction. The particle moves in z direction, of course, with the speed of light. And that means the spatial momentum has the same value as the energy in natural units. So that is our standard momentum. And you see, obviously, uh, there is no limit in which that reduces to this. So the two cases are really distinct. Now, uh, we need to uh, fulfill what we have planned here or outlined. We want to focus on particular Lorentz transformations which have the property that they do not change the momentum. Because these Lorentz transformations might still do something non-trivial to the particle, but they do not change the momentum, so they must change something else. They can only change the spin. So here, what are the possible Lorentz transformations which do not change this momentum, this four momentum? And uh, by the way, the set of all such Lorentz transformations is called the little group. It's called the little group of Lorentz transformations specific to this k mu. Uh, it's uh, the group of Lorentz transformations which leaves that invariant. And so you know that uh, Lorentz transformations in principle, uh, you can uh, uh, denote them by uh, rotations and boosts. So there are three possible rotations around the three axes and three possible boosts along the three axes. And so you can now ask yourself, which of those leaves that thing here invariant? Rotation. The rotations. And uh, around any axis, of course, leave this invariant because the rotations only change the spatial components and they do not change this component at all. So this is invariant under all rotations. Is it also invariant under any boost in any uh, along any axis? All rotations. No, it's not invariant under any boost because whatever you do, if you go to any uh, moving reference frame, you will automatically. Uh, change here the coefficient, you multiply this with this gamma factor from the boost. And so uh, that component will change and you also create some non-zero um, momentum, some uh, really spatial momentum in some direction from your boost. And so it's precisely invariant under all rotations and only under rotations, nothing else. So the little group is exactly the rotation group. Lambda mu nu with the form, so here is just one, and then we have here some rotations, R, which is an element of SO3. Okay. So the little group is simply the ordinary rotation group. What are the group generators? What are the group generators? The group generators of this rotation group are uh, the angular momentum operators. So J, X, Y, and Z, or equivalently J, uh, 2, 3, 3, 1, 1, 2. Those J's are the generators of the little group 
if we apply them, our uh, momentum doesn't change. If we apply any other generator of Lorentz transformations, um, uh, but not one of these, then the momentum will change. Okay, so we now know um, the little group and we know which uh, kind of Lorentz transformations we may apply in order not to change the momentum, uh, but in order to change uh, the spin index. So it's exactly the rotation group. What about here? Here we will get something different. And so we will learn now something about the possible spins of massless particles. So what is the little group of uh, this momentum? Which Lorentz transformations leave invariant this momentum? It's clearly not all rotations. Because in general, if you do a rotation, you change uh, this k here into those components. Therefore, this is not invariant under all rotations. However, it's invariant under some rotations. Yes? Rotations along the, uh, around the z-axis. Right, exactly. So around the z-axis, then only these are interchanged somehow, but they remain zero. So let me write it. Uh, lambda mu nu is equal to chronica delta mu nu plus omega mu nu. And uh, so just some formulas. What we need to have is that omega mu nu k nu is equal to zero where omega mu nu is equal to minus omega nu mu. And what we want to write down is the most general omega mu nu. And actually, I choose here to uh, write it in infinitesimal form because it's much easier to see in infinitesimal form what you can do in order to leave this invariant. And your answer is already a first answer namely rotation around this axis. How do infinitesimal rotations around uh, the z-axis look like? They just look like this, that you would have here in the middle, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. And uh, infinitesimally, cosine theta is just uh, zero, minus theta, plus theta, and zero. That is the infinitesimal form just a sine and cosine expanded in first order of theta. So and uh, if you see, if you act with this omega onto k, then you get zero, of course. So that times this gives a zero for a vector. And then clearly you are right. This defines a certain Lorentz transformation which leaves this invariant. But what else can we do? What else can we do? We cannot do a rotation around uh, any other axis. For example, if we do a rotation around the x-axis, then uh, the k and the zero get somehow exchanged. But we can correct for this by following up the rotation with a certain boost. If we combine such a rotation which generates here something non-zero, then we do a boost afterwards, which makes that zero again. That is possible. And so a certain combination of rotations plus boosts can also leave that invariant. And this is easy to see in infinitesimal form. In infinitesimal form, we simply need here an infinitesimal matrix which maps that to zero. And uh, let me just give you an idea. So if you write here uh, something, what should we write? For example, let's write here B e into that column. That B would correspond to some uh, B minus B, that would correspond to a rotation around uh, the x-axis. That corresponds to a rotation around the x-axis in the same way as this corresponds to a rotation around the z-axis. Okay? That is a rotation around the x-axis. So if we apply this onto that four vector, we do not get zero because that B hits the K over there. And so we do not get zero. However, if we write here minus b and then apply it onto that four vector, uh, or plus b in fact, plus b because uh, it's lower index, plus b, if we apply it now to this four vector, we get zero. So that b corresponds to a rotation around the x-axis and that b corresponds to a boost in the y-axis. And so the combination of the two 
uh, maps that to zero. So if, if we interpret this as an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, then it leaves this momentum invariant. And so we can fill up this matrix in a similar way. So if we have here minus a plus a, then this would correspond to a rotation how, um, around the y-axis. This corresponds to a rotation around the y-axis. And uh, it doesn't leave it invariant, but if we write also here minus a, then it leaves it invariant. So it would be a rotation around the uh, y-axis followed by a boost in the x-direction. Okay, and now we have to fill the entire matrix. It, the matrix should be anti-symmetric, so let's uh, make it anti-symmetric. So here we must have zero in the diagonal. Then we have here minus a plus a plus b minus b. Um, and here we have zero. So this is a matrix with three independent parameters, a, b, and theta. And uh, it corresponds to a rotation around the z-axis and this certain combinations of the other rotations with certain boosts. And uh, you can check again at home that really this matrix, if you act with it onto that four vector, you always get zero no matter what a, b, and theta are. So that shows you that also here we have a little group of Lorentz transformations which leave this momentum invariant. And the little group has three independent parameters. So it's a three-parameter Lie group. It's a Lie group with three different generators. And so what are the group generators analogous to this here in the right case? So in order to figure out what is exactly this combination of the j's which leave it invariant, you can uh, plug in this expression, one half omega rho sigma times j rho sigma. This was our term in the expansion of um, our representation. And if you now plug in this form for the omega matrix, multiply with j rho sigma, then you get certain terms. For example, you get here minus theta, which is the 1, 2 component, minus theta times j 1, 2. Uh, so you get j12 times minus theta and so on. So let me write down minus theta times j12 plus you get a times j13 uh, and here minus a times j01 and so on. So let me write it down plus a times j31 plus j01 plus b times j23 plus J two zero. So this is our set of generators, and that means this generator leaves our momentum invariant, that generator leaves our momentum invariant, and this generator leaves our momentum invariant. So we get particular combinations of J components, and let's give them some names. Obviously, I will call that capital A. So this is capital A times this coefficient A. And I call that capital B. It's the coefficient of that B over there. And then we have uh, three generators of our little group. But they are not the angular momentum, but they are angular momentum in z-direction. And the two combinations A and B, certain combinations of specific rotations and boosts. So you first of all see that the little group which leaves the momentum invariant is different in the case of a massive particle and a massless particles. And the little group corresponds to the internal degree of freedom, in other words, to the spin. Therefore, the behavior of spin and the nature of spin, the meaning of spin, is different for a massive particle and for a massless particle. This is the first important physics result that we learn here. Actually, I think uh, the statement here fits nicely here. So let me write down a statement which is at the same time an exercise for you on the space 
of uh, states spanned by all these states with a specific momentum k comma s so we have fixed k variable s so there are a discrete number of states here with different spin degree of freedom but uh, always the same k so this is a subspace of our one particle system on this space uh, this uh, operator w mu which we defined late yesterday this uh, acts within the space So in other words, it doesn't change the momentum. If you act with W mu on any such state, you will get another one of this same set of states. And uh, this W mu is a four vector operator, so it has four components. Each component is one operator. And what are those operators? The components of W mu are always the little group generators. Namely, in the case of massive particles, the W mu operator has the upper index, upper index, W mu with upper index is the following four vector of operators, namely zero and then J vector times the mass. Okay? J vector is the vector of the angular momentum operator in x, y and z direction. So in this what we have identified here, the angular momentum operators are the little group generators for our specific momentum. And uh, for massive particles, this W mu contains exactly here uh, the angular momentum vector. And here it contains zero. So the statement is correct. The components of W are the little group generators. The proof is your exercise. And for a massless particle, m square equals zero, w mu has the following form, namely uh, this k value times j z b a and j z. Okay. So it has uh, the spin or, or angular momentum in z direction in the zeroth and in the third component and it has these new operators b and a in the middle. So again the four components contain three different operators and these three different operators are exactly the generators of the little group of this particular momentum. So you see uh, that this operator w mu which we have defined yesterday has uh, an interesting meaning, namely it contains these little group generators and the little group generators in turn have the meaning that they define how uh, the internal spin degree of freedom acts, how it behaves. Switch on the light. Okay, now we need to go on with our table. Let's continue with our table and we now need to determine this structure of the little group in more detail. In physical terms, we are now investigating the nature of the spin, the behavior of the spin. So let's compare here massive and massless. So for the mass massive case, um, as I said, we can learn a lot from the non-relativistic limit and in fact uh, you already should understand what the meaning of the spin is. Uh, and because it just is the behavior of ordinary angular momentum in the rest frame. So uh, we have a rest frame, the particle is at rest, it doesn't move and it can be rotated in all directions. That's it. That's what you know from a particle at rest. And so 
the spin is therefore the angular momentum at rest. As simple as that. That's what you are familiar with. Spin is the angular momentum at rest. And it's um, and uh, we had also the question, what should we define as the label of the spin, this S? So we have some additional operator which we can diagonalize. So which operator could we now, for example, diagonalize? We could, for example, diagonalize JZ, the operator uh, spin in Z direction, um, on this uh, space of the particle at rest. These three angular momenta, they don't commute, so we cannot simultaneously have eigenvalues of all angular momenta in all directions, but we can select one, for example, uh, angular momentum in Z direction at rest, which is the spin in Z direction, and we can use that as the additional label. But let us write down the commutational relations first of all. What are the commutational relations of our generators? You know them, they are the beloved angular momentum commutation relations, but let me write them down in a certain way, namely Jz commutator with Jx or with Jy, and let's write it down all in one go, namely plus minus i times Jy. What is the meaning of this combination Jx plus minus i times Jy? Who knows it? Yeah. Letter operator, so they increase or decrease the Jz quantum number and the eigenvalue, right? So it's also J plus minus. So, and the result of this commutation relation is simply plus minus this same thing, Jx plus or minus i times Jy. That's what we mean by letter operators. So uh, this bracket is reproduced here with plus minus. So that's what we mean by letter operators. Okay, so Jz with uh, these x and y give Jx and y, as you know. What happens if you do the commutator between Jx and Jy, so between those two, what you get? You know it, of course, you get Jz, i times Jz. Good. Okay, so far so good. Letter operators and uh, the thing that you increase or decrease can be constructed by the commutator of the other two. Okay. What are the commutation relations of those three operators? So Jz, comma, and let me just do it in the same way. A plus minus I times B. Why not? So it's an exercise. Let's not do the calculation here, but I invite you to do it at home. It's of course a simple calculation by just plugging in all the indices in the general relationship. And then you see that JC A contains A contains rotation around the y-axis, so A contains JY. The result will be JX, but B contains JX. And on the other hand, A also contains a boost in X direction. If you rotate a boost in X direction along the Z direction, you get a boost in Y direction. B contains a boost in Y direction. So you can sort of sense, if you do a commutator of JZ with A, you get B. If you do a commutator of JZ with B, you get A. You can sort of guess it. And you can check it exactly. And you get it with certain plus minus one prefactors. And if you do this combination, what you get is exactly the same as on the left, namely you get plus or minus a plus minus i times b. Okay? So you would see that a and b behave exactly in the same way as jx and jy on the left. They behave like letter operators which could increase or decrease the jz quantum number. So, so far it looks very similar, but now comes a very crucial difference. Namely, what happens if you do the commutator of A and B? If you do the commutator of A and B, you cannot reconstruct Jz. You cannot reconstruct Jz, but you get zero. A and B commute. You can check it directly by explicit calculation. That means even though they can raise or lower the Jz quantum numbers, you cannot obtain Jz on its own 
from the commutation rule. And that has a decisive consequence. Namely, suppose uh, JZ has a non-zero eigenvalue. Then here it is actually possible that at the same time A and B have zero eigenvalues. Zero eigenvalue of A and B is compatible with non-zero eigenvalue of JZ. And that is never compatible here. Here if JZ has a non-zero eigenvalue, but Jx and Y have zero eigenvalues, then you get a contradiction. Non-zero here and zero there, that doesn't work. So if you have a non-zero eigenvalue of Jz, you automatically also have non-zero uh, action of the other angular momenta. And that means that if you have a particle which is polarized in z direction and you do a rotation along any other axis, you get of course a polarization in the other axis. This is just a rotation. So you can rotate your particle, you have some rota uh, axis polarization, maybe in z direction, and you can rotate the particle into any other polarization. Here, however, it is possible that the particle is polarized in z direction, but uh, the action of all the other operators is actually zero. So let's write it down. That is possible while A and B are zero. And then uh, you have diagonalized actually all three operators simultaneously. These two have zero eigenvalue and that might have a non-zero eigenvalue. So this is mathematically possible. And it's not mathematically possible here. And so the physical observation now is that actually all massless particles which have ever been observed behave exactly in this way. They behave, behave in a way that the eigenvalues of this a and b are only zero. So never has a particle been observed with a non-zero eigenvalue of this a or b operator. All the observations are compatible with zero a and b, but non-zero jz eigenvalues are observed. And so we have to accept this as a physical observation. All massless particles, all massless particle states have a equal b equal zero, but possibly j is e non zero. Okay, and then we can now conclude and write down our result for uh, what is the meaning of spin and what is the label S of our particle states. So the irreducible uh, representations of uh, this little group here is just the um, uh, angular momentum group. And that means all the possible particle types uh, are labeled by a quantum number j corresponding to the total angular momentum at the rest frame, which is uh, integer or half integer. So j must be element of this set. It corresponds to the total spin. Uh, and this, so the meaning of this is the j square in the rest frame. It's the angular momentum square in the rest frame. And this has the eigenvalue j times j plus 1 as usual. And then we can label the states k, comma, s such that s corresponds to the eigenvalue of jz, for example. So the spin in z direction. And that means that spin has the same meaning as in non-relativistic quantum mechanics.
Okay, but what about uh, the massless case? Here in the massless case, the irreducible representations, uh, or in other words, the possible types of massless particles, they are characterized by a quantity which is the eigenvalue of Jz. This can still have some value. And uh, that eigenvalue is called the helicity. It's the helicity of the particle S, which is the eigenvalue of Jz for states K uh, S. Okay, and uh, the momentum of those states is uh, along the z-axis. That means this helicity is the spin or angular momentum in the direction of momentum. That is the meaning of helicity. And so now we see that actually if we do um, Lorentz transformation, our general Lorentz transformation, then this uh, eigenvalue cannot change anymore. So this helicity is actually Lorentz invariant. And uh, so it can take only a single value. Whatever eigenvalue we happen to have, it's the same for all states of this particle type. There is one exception. The exception is if we have a parity transformation and uh, nature allows such a parity transformation or a reflection under a reflection angular momenta are um, transformed to minus themselves. So if nature allows such a parity symmetry operation then uh, also minus s is a possible eigenvalue. And for example for the photon that is possible. The photon is such a massless particle and uh, it allows reflections and then the photon can have plus or minus a certain helicity and in the case of the photon that helicity is actually one. So the photon can have helicity plus or minus one. But whenever you fix one helicity then under these Lorentz transformations the helicity does not change. So the possible states of such massless particles are either only k comma s with a fixed s or k comma s and k comma minus s with a certain s. Let me just add one sentence of a kind of conclusion in order to connect it again to the behavior of this operator W mu. Because as we mentioned before, this W mu operator contains in its components the generators of the little group. So this is the operator you want to consider if you want to investigate all of this in detail. And so it's now interesting to record what is the behavior of W mu in the two cases as well. So massive case m square equals zero. Then I already wrote down what W mu is. Um, and then the square W square W mu W mu is given by minus mass square times 
j times j plus 1. So uh, the eigenvalue of this w square operator, which is Lorentz invariant because it's a Casimir operator, is the combination rest mass square times the total spin of the particle. And uh, this w square, if you act with it on any state of this particle type, it will always give you this eigenvalue. So it characterizes the spin. And in the massless case, in the massless case, this w square would actually be zero, as you can see from here. It would be zero, so w square has zero eigenvalues. But um, if we also know that a and e are now zero, then it's good to look at the components, even w mu. w mu has then these components, jz. Um, uh, in the uh, rest frame it was JC, but in general I can actually write down W mu on any particle state of this type, P comma S, uh, has the following form, namely it is given by S um, times P0 times, uh, sorry, uh, times P mu acting on the same state. Uh, so let me remove, so this doesn't look very good. The operator W mu acting on a particle state of this type is related to the momentum operator P mu by uh, the simple proportionality. And the proportionality constant between the two is the helicity S of the particle. That is the behavior of this W mu in the case of massless particles. And this relation is valid for all uh, states of this type. Okay. And from our calculation here on this blackboard, it follows that this relation is valid in the frame of this particular momentum, because there we have the explicit representation for the particular momentum. Uh, we know W mu contains the Jz and Jz gives S. But uh, then afterwards, this and that behave in a Lorentz covariant way. Therefore, the relationship must be valid in all frames and therefore for all states of this particular particle type. So this ends our discussion of one particle states. We have learned what the spin degree of freedom actually means. And uh, therefore, we have a classification of all possible types of particles that can possibly appear in a Poincaré invariant quantum theory. That is quite a deep result and a far-reaching result too. Um, as I already announced yesterday, because you can interface it to the other result that we have obtained on the possible types of fields in a theory. Okay. But let's first um, enjoy this particular result. Now we can quantify a little bit this conflict that is already visible that I already alluded to yesterday. Namely, this conflict is on the mismatch between the possible types of particles and the possible types of fields. And uh, because we will spend a great deal of time in the next weeks to quantize particles of different spins, so we will come back to this a lot, let me just indicate one example. Let me just indicate one single example. Namely, let us think of spin one. If you uh, remember yesterday, there we discussed the possible types of fields and we classified the types of fields according to the representations of the Lorentz group and there was one field representation which corresponds to the so-called one half comma one half representation this would be a spin one field or potentially a field which can describe spin one because at least it looks like spin one and it corresponds to a vector field a mu of x. This field has four degrees of freedom because it has four components. Mu can run from zero to three. So it's a four component field. 
Now, uh, let's suppose we want to use that to describe spin one particles because we have already seen uh, field quanta will be particle-like. But what do we know about spin one particles? We have just learned we need to distinguish between massless and massive. What do we know about massive spin one particles? The massive spin one particles have a spin degree of freedom and the spin degree of freedom behaves exactly like you are used to from angular momentum discussion in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So if a particle has spin one, it means uh, it is labeled by spin in z direction, spin z, and spin z can take the values plus, minus one and zero. These are three different numbers. So you get three degrees of freedom, but not four. So you see a mismatch. You will have one degree of freedom less for your particles than you have for your field description. But what happens for mass zero? For mass zero, the helicity is, is not a uh, spin anymore, but the helicity and the helicity is Lorentz invariant. At most, you can flip it to plus minus s, so if you have spin 1, you might at most have helicity plus minus 1. These are two different numbers. So you see that the mismatch here is even greater. If you want to describe a spin 1 massless particle with a vector field, you have two degrees of freedom too much in your field description. And here you have one degree of freedom too much. And that is the mismatch that I have alluded to, and the mismatch gets greater and greater the higher you go in spin, because simply there is no one-to-one -one mapping at all between the field types labeled by J1, J2, and the particle types labeled by spin or by helicity. There is really a very different behavior of the two types of objects that we have in our theory. And that mismatch means that in our description of particles by fields for spin 1, there will be a great deal of difficulty. And uh, in particular here, we need to get rid of two degrees of freedom. And how can we get rid of, uh, of degrees of freedom? We get rid of degrees of freedom by gauge invariance. And uh, by constraints that we discussed in the first lectures, uh, lectures of our semester. And so therefore, you see here from this conflict of integer numbers uh, that something deep has to go on. And uh, there is not even only gauge invariance in the sense of unphysical degrees of freedom that can be gauged away, but there is more to it. Namely, the interactions that spin one particles can possibly have must be gauge invariant interactions, and that means spin one particles must, for example, couple to conserved currents like the electromagnetic current, which is a conserved quantity. And it, the theory becomes inconsistent if you would couple such uh, gauge invariant, uh, such a spin one particle, massless particle, to a charge which is not conserved. That is a non obvious statement, but it's a very important statement. It's a prediction of the quantum field theory framework for all possible interactions of massless spin one particles. And this prediction of couplings to conserved currents is observed in nature as well. So it's a very deep and very profound general prediction, which is in agreement with observation. And this follows here. You see it already happening from this conflict uh, between fields and particles. Okay, but this is only an indication and of course we will do it now step by step and our approach of the next few weeks will be to quantize fields and to obtain the resulting particles in our description as the outcome of our field theory quantization. And we will not start with this case, but this will be our final case and before we will practice with spin zero and then spin one half. And finally we will come to the spin one case which will have these interesting features we will, which we will then also discuss in detail. Okay, but uh, this is just to let you know that something interesting will happen. And that is also why I wanted to show you this background information. Here, the Poincaré study, and before also the study of uh, gauge invariance and constraints in the Lagrangian framework. Um, 
such that you can afterwards understand how it is all connected. Now we have more time and we can begin with our first real section of the quantum field theory lecture this year, which is not background information, but actual information, quantum field theory information. This is our section two, and it is the section on the quantization of such fields. And we will begin with the quantization of free fields without interactions, and that will already give us a lot of insight on what I said before and also much more. So we are from now on only doing relativistic quantum field theory, but I will not always stress it. But here in the uh, section title I stress it, it's the quantization of free covariant, relativistically covariant fields in the sense as we have defined it yesterday. Let me maybe spend most of the remaining time on explaining something else after we have explained particles and mismatches and so on. Let me explain also some um, different possibilities on approaches to teaching quantum field theory. Okay, so there is a traditional approach. And let me call it uh, Weinberg's approach. And Weinberg's approach is followed also by a few other authors and I highlight here in particular the very nice book by Duncan which is not so well known but really very good. And there is also a very good and nice book by Cliff Burgess and both of them follow basically um, the Weinberg approach. And most other books follow the traditional approach and now uh, many of the very modern books they do kind of a mixture like we also do in the lecture. Okay, but what is really the very traditional approach which is done in all the books from the 80s, 70s, 60s and before? It is to say field theory is a very nice class of theories. We know field theories on the classical level can be relativistic theories. We love general relativity. We love Maxwell's equations. Those are all field theories. So let us study quantum field theory and see what happens. That is the approach. And then uh, you simply write down some Lagrangians for uh, covariant fields, covariant Lagrangians. You quantize them and you obtain something, some result. And what you obtain are of course theories with particles in them because as we have already seen, particles arise as field quanta or wave quanta. All quantization of fields always leads to particles and automatically to Fox spaces of particles of identical either bosonic or fermionic particles. This is always an automatic consequence of a field quantization. And you can study all kinds of classical theories that you invent or that you like or that you know that they might be true, quantize them and study the results. Weinberg's approach is different and he starts by asking the question, why on earth should anybody be interested in fields in the first place? Because we might not observe fields in nature, for example the electron is a particle, we do not observe directly an electron field, so why would anybody like to start with quantizing an electron field? And why would anybody write down an electron field theory in the first place instead of an electron particle? So the question here raises is why should we study field theory at all? And uh, therefore he doesn't start with it, but field theory is the outcome. He starts with particles and quantum theories and unitary representations of the Poincaré group. So in a sense he tries to go as general as possible and say the only thing that we really know in this approach is we know quantum mechanics and relativity. 
And if the combination means that we need a unitary representation of the Poincaré group on our Hilbert space of quantum states. That is the only thing we know. And then we try to construct a full quantum theory, which means, of course, we need more than this. We need interactions, for example. And the question is then, how could interactions possibly look like which are compatible with such a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. So the question is basically, what is the most general relativistic theory with interactions? What is the most general such theory with interactions? Okay, and he gets an answer. And the answer is quantum field theory. The answer is, namely, more precisely speaking, that in order to construct relativistic interactions, you need a tool. And the tool that he comes up with is uh, so-called causal quantum fields. And those are our quantum fields. They are called causal here in this context because they have certain specific important commutation relations and then uh, they arise as tools, you could really say. They are necessary as tools and once you have these tools in your toolbox, you can really construct a relativistic quantum theory. Okay, and uh, then in this way uh, one has motivated quantum field theory and then of course you could also go back here and study all possible kinds of quantum field theories like in the traditional approach. So in that way you could also go in circles. Let me um, explain a little bit my point of view on both approaches. So I do not say that this approach is better or superior than the other one and uh, uh, neither would I say that this is superior. Both approaches are useful to know about. For sure, it is a very good thing for a theoretical physicist to ask what is the most general theory that is compatible with certain basic postulates or very certain basic observations of nature like relativity plus quantum mechanics. That is a very good question and this question is kind of bypassed in that approach. Here you do not ask what is the most general relativistic theory, you just start with field theory and quantize it uh, and you do not give a really good reason why you would do it. But a good reason is found here. So you start with very basic observations that you think are true and uh, then you come up with this. However, uh, it is also not a mathematically rigorous statement that these causal quantum fields are really the only way you could construct a relativistic quantum theory but it's the tool which becomes kind of obvious, which does the job. If you construct those causal quantum fields, then for sure you can get relativistically invariant theories with interactions. But there is not a mathematical guarantee or no mathematical proof that there is no other way. Therefore, the approach is not maybe logically, completely mathematically um, convincing. And, uh, okay, on the other hand, here you could improve the approach a little bit by at least asking what is the most general Lorentz invariant field theory and that is what we are going to do. So what uh, will be our approach is actually to construct basically all covariant uh, field theories. At least theoretically one could do it, but we will at some point stop. Uh, <laughs> but we have the classification of all possible covariant fields and therefore we can go through this infinite list, but we will stop at spin one uh, and instead of going to infinity. Now uh, another critique to both approaches is that uh, once you are here in this approach, you have nicely motivated at least these causal quantum fields, then there is still some um, uh, let's say, uh, um, how do I say, unsatisfactory issue because these tools, these as nice as they are and as causal and as compatible with relativity as they are, they do not on their own completely guarantee 
that the theory that you get out at the end is really um, in line with your basic postulates. In addition to those tools, you need to add some additional dirty details and dirty tricks. And uh, if you don't do it, then you violate Lorentz invariance after you have set up these causal interactions. And uh, that dirty details is uh, again connected, for example, with gauge invariance. So you only need uh, specific interactions in order to have gate, um, Lorentz invariant interactions, and those interactions are then gauge invariant as well. But here something similar happens. If you have those covariant fields, you can go through this infinite list, study all possible field types, write down very beautiful and consistent classical field theories, and then you go to the quantization procedure. And then it's not a guarantee that you end up with a physically reasonable theory. What could, for example, happen is that you quantize, and after the quantization you get a Hamiltonian which has no ground state. It can happen that the Hamiltonian uh, automatically gives rise to states with arbitrarily negative energy, so you have no ground state and then your theory has no interpretation because in nature there is always a lowest energy state. And, uh, uh, that sometimes doesn't exist. Similarly, if you start with a quantization of certain classical fields in the quantum theory, you get quantum states, and uh, every property of the quantum states follows from the properties of your classical theory, including the scalar products of certain basis states, and uh, that implies also the norm of your quantum state. So sometimes it can happen here that you predict that the norm of a state is negative. If the norm of a state is negative, then you cannot interpret your quantum theory either because that would correspond to a negative probability. So such quantum theories have to be thrown away. And uh, therefore this procedure doesn't automatically guarantee to lead to certain theories. You again also need to apply some restrictions here, and that also is connected, for example, to gauge invariance in order to have consistent theories. Okay, so what I want to say with this is in the lecture three years ago, which is on video, I followed kind of more this sort of approach, and this semester I will follow very closely this traditional approach, but in the end uh, everything will come together anyway. Okay, so now we have no time anymore. And so we can stop, and next time we will then uh, really start seriously with going through the list of uh, all possible covariant fields, starting with spin zero, the scalar field, quantize it, and uh, discover what is going to happen. Okay, see you on Thursday.